Uh, yeah, hi, this is Tony. Welcome to another episode of Crime Pace of Bad and He Does It. You could see we're here in a Florida panhandle, all right? Only a few miles inland from the coast, you could see this uh, substrate we're on is uh, this sand. But it's it's not pure sand. It's like sandy clay. It's like sandy loam. Okay, you got kind of like a Play-Doh texture when it gets wet. You could see the ground is also covered in all these cool lichens, as well as a plethora of other plants that seem to be adapted to the, uh, the dryland habitat. Right here, this is Chrysoma posiflaculosa. Posiflascula. Just call it Chrysoma for short, okay? It's a, kind of a mouthful to spit out. But you can see it's a very important plant here. It's one of the dominant ones forming these little shrubs. Asteraceae sunflower family, and it's uh, related to goldenrod. It's basically a woody, shrubby goldenrod. It blooms late in the season. Like late summer, you can see there's the old uh, inflorescences right there. And then look at those leaves with that red stem. Okay, kind of almost sheathing leaves, all right? Absent a petiole, and you can see all the glands, those white glands all over them, giving them a minty green appearance. So check out some of the other plants that grow here. You can see they've been burning intermittently too, which uh, this whole habitat, these sand scrublands are fire dependent. All these plants are adapted to fire, including that Serenoa repens, that uh, saw palmetto you can see over there in the distance. And since this is a sun-loving species that needs the sand, the fast draining soils, and uh, the lack of uh, competition and overgrowth, uh, it's growing on a power line easement, which, you know, the, the frequent mowing and uh, masticating mimics fire, mimics the disturbance of fire, which prevents all the woody overgrowth and uh, pines from taking over. We got another species of lupin, Lupinus diffusus. This is the third species we've seen in a panhandle the last few days. You can see it's doing that whole quasi-unifolia thing again with those two vestigial leaves down there. See that? It's looking like little bracts. So most lupins have three leaves, but the Florida ones, most of them seem to only have one, except they've still got the two vestigial ones. That uh, Those leaves are covered in strigos hairs, little strigos hairs. Look at that, just purple, purple flowers. And it's growing here with the chrysoma, and the, uh, which is just like a woody solid dago, and the prickly pear, and the geobalanus, etc. Look at another nice lupin. You got the road noise, you got the generating station. How nice. Ultimate uh, Florida wildlife experience. Anyway, this one is a pretty interesting one. Clinopodium is the genus, so it's in the mint family Lamiaceae. Clinopodium coccinium. It blooms in fall, it's got red flowers, and uh, there's those leaves. You can see they're opposite. In keeping with the trademarks of the Lamiaceae family, the mint family, they got opposite leaves. And let's see if they got a little bit of a smell to them. We crush them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Clinop Clinopodium, of course, is the same genus that the, the California plant Yerba Buena is in, but that's a trailing one. This is a this is a, a woody shrub. So you see without burning how quickly uh, the woods take over, all the woody undergrowth. See that? All right, you got these, uh, the pines are adapted to it. You can see it's cl more cleared out over there. That probably had a fire in the last few years, but over here there's been nothing, and so it just takes over. And as humans, we tend to like the more open environments, better for hunting, uh, better for bugs, uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, look at this plant right here. This is a pretty cool one. You got a massive bloom of this salvia going off, salvia lyrata, which works as a really good ground cover in a region too, in lieu of a lawn, as you can see. All right, just mow it on the high setting if you need to mow, and uh, you know, give it time to come back and flower, and then when it's done, mow it again. And when you mow it, you'll also be dispersing those seeds everywhere. There's that flower somewhat narrow and then there's that the distinct salvia calyx that ridged calyx ah this salvia is so nice 900 species in the genus salvia you can see it's just got those basal rosette so it can be mowed you'd be cutting off those scapes but you wait till it's done flowering you're just effectively spreading seed smells nice too all right like all the salvias because they're in the mint family but look at that just that nice basal rosette and once it get, get once it gets established it outcompetes the grass Look at it. it. Is it is it shit or puke? It's Nostoc. It's a cyanobacteria. See that? Nostoc communis, which can completely dry out uh, and go dormant. Just a bacterial film. How about that? Always like seeing that. We get that in the uh, the uh, West Texas area too. Actually, South Texas, where the Gulf Coast transitions to desert, but still gets humid enough for the Nostoc to just grow on the ground like that. There's a tiny little member of the iris family, Cicerinchium rosulatum. See, the flowers are white with like a purple inner part that a corolla. And little bulls would also do well uh, as a lawn. There's those uh, characteristic iridaceae leaves, those sheathing, 
sheathing uh, leaves. That guy, look at his big ass bumblebee. He's weighing the whole. He's weighing the whole scape down. Look at it. Okay, now you know we're here in a, in a pine scrublands where they do burn, and we're looking at a pretty interesting plant. It's not flowering right now, unfortunately, but I'm still going to show it to you because it's just such a weird disjunction. A disjunction uh, means that biogeographically speaking, a plant or animal uh, occurs quite a ways away from uh, the rest of the members of its range, all right, or the other, uh, you know, the majority of the, of the distribution where it occurs. This is Cromaria lanceolata, and the flowers resemble these little pink, they almost look like little orchid flowers, all right, they're very bizarre, and uh, this genus is very common in more arid areas, okay, in both South America and North America, all right, it's related to creosote in the family Zygophilaceae, but to see it here, okay, so far east, uh, is really, really bizarre, all right? And I have uh, I knew these were out here, and I uh, specifically wanted to show them to you because they represent how an arid microsite can exist in a more mesic and uh, generally wetter area, okay? You get a change up in the soils, and you get a change up in the plant community, and you get other plant species that occur. So because this is burned, because it's occurring on sand, because it's fast draining, relatively nutrient poor sand, you get that cremaria. The cremaria is also what's called a hemiparasite. So it's a partial parasite. It can photosynthesize on its own, but it's also gonna parasitize other plants. Here's another dry land lover, all right? A member of the uh, spike moss clade, all right? So really early diverging vascular plants, all right? A quote unquote primitive lineage, okay? This is in the genus Bryodesma. And this is Bryodesma arenicola. It used to be Selaginella arenicola, but uh, it's uh, related to those uh, plants known as resurrection plants. Not resurrection fern, because it's technically not a fern, but it does reproduce by spores. So these these plants can all uh, they're poikilohydric. So these plants can all dry out. All right, that's the word for that. Poikilohydric. They can basically go dormant and feel completely dry, and then just spring back to life uh, when they get rain. But again, it's another it's another weird one to see out here in uh, the, the southeast, all right? But it does inhabit those dry microsites. There's Ariagonum tomentosum, another plant, another genus that's much more uh, commonly distributed in dry areas, especially in the western half of the United States. There's like 200 species out there. But uh, here, you only get this one species growing on the sand. And look at that Cremaria, see that? It's odd how this one's just a creeper, it's a crawler, you know? But there's, uh, you get like Cremaria cystisoides in the Nuevo Leon, which is a, you know, medium-sized shrub. And down slope a ways, you can look across there and see a bunch of different Saracenia species. Looks like Flava, you got Leucophila over there as well. Rather large ones. Oh, someone lost the floaty. You see the little pool noodle? Very clear water, too. Oh, it's beautiful. With that, uh, is that Pinus eliadii or Palustris in the background? I guess it's uh, it kind of looks like eliadii. Check that out, you got Drosera intermedia just floating. Another carnivorous plant just, just floating on a little mat of organic debris. See those spatulate leaves, a sundew? God, that's wild, I've only ever, I didn't know it was a floater, I thought it was just terrestrial. Oh, well, you're just a beautiful little green stick in the middle of the road, aren't you? Oh look, you got that yellow underbelly too, look at that. You lane, you know, you're lucky someone didn't run over you. All right, I didn't even see you. Look at that beautiful pattern. You like the longleaf pines? Oh, snakes can't hear, I always forget that. Look at this, Heterotheca subaxillaris. We get this in Texas. A sticky, a sticky aster. Got a nice smell to it. Como se dice semi arboreal. That's why you're green, isn't it? That, that's why, because you're normally up in the trees hanging out. You think we can't see you, but we could see you, but we're not going to do no. We, we, just, we, might, we might move you off the road so you don't get smacked by some moron. Now, as you can see right here, we got our friendly neighborhood uh, water moccasin. All right, beautiful little bastard. This is a young one. Okay, we just, uh, we just came up on him. He had his mouth open, wide open, showing the infamous white. And uh, he was rattling his tail. All right, impersonating a rattlesnake, but no, he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a rattle. So though he's related to rattlesnakes, he doesn't actually have a rattle. Well, you're a cute little bastard. There you go. Okay, guy, have a good rest of your afternoon. Okay, so here we got a recent burn. You can still see the fire scars on the trees. The understory uh, is uh, mostly died back. You got Geobalanus 
and a handful of ferns coming up, as well as this species of lithospermum, which is a rather species-rich genus in the Americas, in the family Boraginaceae. You got those scorpioid cymes, as you can see right there, curling back like a little uh, scorpion tail. So I've seen small ones, you know, small perennials in West Texas. I've seen four foot tall ones in uh, the Oaxaca cloud forest and also down there in Michoacan. So there's all kinds of variations on the genus Lithospermum. This is Lithospermum virginianum. You can see the bees are hidden in. But it's kind of odd though because these flowers are not especially showy. See that? Look at the calyces. Damn, look at all those hairs on there too. All right. Styles poking out right there. Stamens are included in that flower. Down here we got Tephrosia virginiana. Wonderful little pea. See that with those two, uh, you got a pink banner and then like a magenta colored uh, set of wings. And then the keel, which is just two fused petals at the base of it. And of course the pinnate foliage. Just coming, coming, coming up fresh from this burn scar. But look at how quick stuff comes back. This was burned very recently, like the last few months, and stuff is already popping back. Seemingly unscathed. Oh, nice croton. Argaranthemus. That's a pretty great plant. Dicanthelium, very species-rich genus of grass. How many species of dicanthelium in the southeast? Oaks are coming back. There's a bunch of Rus copalinum, too, one of the sumacs. You can clearly see that fire is integral to this ecosystem. Look at all this. This is an ericaceous bastard, some species of vaccinium. One of the like 12 different species of vaccinium at <laughs> the croton here. You can see it's just everywhere, just coming right back. This is very recently burned. It comes back so quick. Look at it. Stylingia sylvatica, Euphorbiaceae. Flowering already. See that? See those uh, three, three branch styles on the bottom, and of course, male flowers up top. So, male flowers. Uh, top 80% of the spike and then at the bottom you get the female flowers. Got another Rincosia species, another P, Rincosia riniformis. Yeah, this is a really recent burn. This is like last three weeks. Somebody cut a hole in that flower. Little bastards. The leaves on that too. Pretty scabbard. But this long leaf seedling, this little green torch survived even though, you know, it's only three feet tall. It burned all the way down, but it's still alive. It's doing fine. So that, uh, that bark was thick enough, even though it's still only a few years old. Even these, these little seedlings survived. That's a pine. Looks like a bunch grass. It's a longleaf pine, Pinus palustris. Came through the fire fine. I mean, it lost, it lost a few needles, but it'll be fine. Look at this. Look at this Camus cypress dioides. It's just so, the landscape is just these higher, drier sites composed of, uh, sand and scrub mixed with uh, alternating with these inundated areas where you get pitcher plants and Camisipris dioides and Taxodium ascendens and Nyssa biflora, one of the tupelos. Yeah, so this, this edge of this beautiful creek, it's got kind of like a Camisipris dioides bog. And then we have a lone Saracenia leucophylla plant. Look at that. You got anybody in there? No, not yet. No. But look, you could see all those hairs that prevent the insects from getting out. Lithospermum carolinians. The common name for this is hairy pocoon. <laughs> Touch my hairy pocoon. Where did that come from? God, that's probably my favorite common name I've encountered in the South so far. So we'll finish off today on an 18,000 year old, roughly 18,000 year old barrier island. Uh, there's the mainland looking north, and then there's the gulf uh, to the south. We went past a lot of uh, hideous uh, tourist shit, as you can, uh, you can imagine, coming here. But right here, uh, there's not much. Not much in the way of human development. Well, except for that over there. So you can see on the north side of these pure white dunes, okay? Pure white. <laughs> just, just pure silica. We got a really cool plant right here in the genus Perinichia carnation family caryophyllaceae. And there's those umbels of tiny flowers, as you can see right there. I've seen a couple Perinichia, uh, actually in a Colorado, the eastern part of Colorado, where it's uh, high and dry. But uh, didn't think there'd be one here. So again, another dry land genus adapted to these uh, drier habitats. You can see we got a whole plethora of uh, plant life over here, including some pines as well as magnolia, 
grand the floor out right there. Check that out at Dune Magnolia. Oh, I can smell these flowers from here. Stamens on the bottom and uh, stigmas up top. Resembling a cone of many carpels, so those stamens eventually fall off. These do, and then uh, what's left, uh, once these are pollinated, those turn that turns into the actual cone with the bright red fruit inside. Yeah, so you can see those stamens are already hissing. So these are protogynous, so they're female first, then they, then those uh, anthers open, and the uh, whole thing should be done now. So this is, this is already pollinated, basically. God, look at all that pollen in there. Look at all that. Still coming off. So female first, then male. So you see we got Serenoa repens and that Chrysoma that I showed you earlier. Porciflasculosa is dominant here too. And these fast draining sand. Check this out. Here we, here we got a species of ground cherry in the genus Physalis. Physalis angustifolia. All right, nightshade family, Solanaceae. Look at those anthers in there. Look at that. See them dehissing? Five dehissing anthers in that style in the center. All those five petals fused into a little yellow cone. Glaber's foliage, look at that glaber's, ooh, it stinks too. Oh, it's pungent. It smells just kind of chemical, as nightshades tend to do. Here's another one, what a beautiful plant though. Narrow leaves adapted to this harsh exposure on this, uh, this barren sand. <laughs> this is hilarious. These Krumholtz magnolias, look at that. Just kept short by the wind. Kept short by, kept short by that sea breeze. And then right here we got a species of vitus. All right, a species of grape. Vitaceae is the family there. See that there's those developing flowers. Or is that fruits? I can't really tell. Looks like those are going to be buds. Either way, it's a species of vitus. Just crawling along the dunes. And I, I don't know why, but I wasn't expecting to find the Sclepius humistrata out here. Look at that. Oh, that smells incredible. That flower smells absolutely incredible. Look at those, those petals haven't even opened yet. Just little pink pentagons. See where they've opened on the other ones, just recurved. That foliage is always such. Look at that foliage. Is, oh my god. This fucking milkweed species is so incredible. I love it. Waxy. That root goes deep too, like four feet into that ground. Look at that. Those stress pigments, bright red pigments on those uh, two leaves nearest the inflorescence. Look at that umble. Look at the Umbelanus Asclepius. God damn it, that's incredible. Oh, this guy just fell off. I just disturbed him. Look at that. That spider just got that grasshopper. He's working with the milkweed. He's working for it. He's acting like a bouncer. I still can't get over that thing. That is so incredible. Oh, my God. What a stunner of a milkweed. Jesus Christ. Let's see, that spider just went back up. Wait, but is he gonna just leave his meal there or what? You gotta get that grasshopper. I might I might kill that grasshopper myself and put it back on the leaves for him, you know? Asclepius humistrata, everybody. And you could see this guy just trailing along the ground. Only a few of his leaves are alive. Aureliaceae is the family in the order of carrots, Apiales. This is Hydrocotyle bonariensis. Unmistakable leaf shape there. Peltate leaves. Look at those, look at those sand grains. Just stick to it. But as many dune plants do, they just trail and kind of run along the ground. They got, look at all these, these are all roots. These ropey shits draped all on top of the dunes. You know, it's hard to imagine that most of the Atlantic coast, at least around the Gulf, look like this. I mean, not with necessarily the white sands, but just such so, so peaceful, you know? I normally associate the Atlantic coast with the Bama, you know, the Boston to Atlanta metropolitan area. Just endless uh, strip malls and, you know, cultural detritus, modern American commercial garbage. Anyway, there's the flowers, the inflorescences rather, on that Aurelia, that Aureliaceae, that hydrocotyle. You can see that tiny flower right there. Shrub, Quercus geminata. It's not going to get very tall because again, it's growing on dunes. And then this is a cool one, Serratiola ericoides. You can see it's providing a lot of cover here. It's growing on top of the dunes, likes the full exposure. Ericoides because it's got ericoid leaves like an erica. Look at that. Narrow and then they've got that indumentum on the underside a really really cool plant I've been wanting to see this for a while only grows along the coast Along the Gulf Coast. It doesn't really grow inland You can see there's another one And just forming a dense a dense shrub here It's obviously pretty important for uh, wildlife Just magnolia right there in the back. Get that. It looks like some sort of damn 
conifer. Jesus Christ, this is such a weird one. Look at it, it does, it looks like some sort of spruce. Anyway, gives you a sprinkling of some of the stuff we got going on. So now we're right on the Gulf. We started off about 20 miles inland. All right, that, uh, those white sands are blinding. Blinding, but beautiful. Anyway, that's all I got for you this evening. Hopefully you have a good rest of your evening. Go fuck yourself, bye.